In this video, we're going to be talking about mirtazapine, which is brand name Remron. And I'll start with a summary overview so we have some context moving forward when we go through everything. So, mirtazapine is used primarily as an antidepressant, but it's also a really sedating medication, so it's particularly useful in patients with insomnia. The upside of the medications is compared to the SSRIs, it has a lot less sexual dysfunction, and it has less GI side effects, and may actually help nausea. The downsides of the medication is that it's sedating, which is what we'd expect with a medication that helps with insomnia, and it can be particularly bad for weight gain. Mirtazapine is FDA approved for major depression, and it's used off-label for insomnia, anxiety disorders like generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder. It's also used off-label for nausea as an appetite stimulant, so sometimes it's used off-label for cancer chemotherapy patients, and that's to help with the cachexia and to improve the nausea. And it's also used off-label for akathisia. So it's reasonable to consider mirtazapine a first-line antidepressant. And for patients who are underweight and have insomnia, it really should be at the top of the list for your medication choices. And that's because for these patients, the main downsides of the medications, which are weight gain and sedation, are really upsides here. And it doesn't come with a lot of the downsides of using the SSRIs, because there's no GI side effects and there's significantly less sexual side effects. So now I'll talk about the mechanism of action of mirtazapine. So mirtazapine largely acts on three neurotransmitter pathways, and those three are histaminergic, serotonergic, and noradrenergic. In regards to histamine, it blocks the H1 receptor. So histamine is a very potent H1 blocker, and it's actually one of the most potent histamine blockers. This is by far the strongest activity of mirtazapine, and it's actually a selective H1 receptor antagonist at low concentrations. But I'll talk more about the differences in dosing in a second. The next neurotransmitter pathway is that it's serotonergic. So mirtazapine is an antagonist at 5-HT2 and 5-HT3 receptors. So to go through each receptor, it blocks the 5-HT2A receptor, which you can learn a little bit more about in the serotonin video. But it's thought that its action here is what lowers drug-seeking behavior, which is why it's effective in patients with methamphetamine use disorder. Then it also has blockade at 5-HT2C, which may play a role in terms of the weight gain with mirtazapine. And then lastly, it blocks the 5-HT3 receptors. So this is the receptor that ondansetron or Zofran acts on. So we know it's the blockade here that improves nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So mirtazapine can be thought of as an antiemetic alternative to Zofran. And then the last receptor system that mirtazapine has activity on is noradrenergic. And this is through the alpha-2 receptor. So mirtazapine blocks alpha-2 adrenergic presynaptic receptors. And we know that alpha-2 receptors are largely inhibitory autoreceptors. So by blocking alpha-2, you're actually increasing adrenergic and serotonergic neurotransmission. It's been hypothesized that mirtazapine acts as an indirect agonist at 5-HT1A as a result of the increased neurotransmission from the alpha-2 blockade. So the gist is it blocks alpha-2, which increases norepinephrine and possibly serotonin. And it's good to know that it has no anti-muscarinic activity. So just a small pause in the video, if you enjoyed this content or my other content, definitely head over to psycho.farm and check out the new antidepressant course. So I put together a course with a ton of videos that go over depression, SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, MAOIs, and the atypicals. I made it with the intent to be accessible and practical. I think it's worthwhile if you're a student or a practicing psychiatrist, you'll still get something out of it. But let's get back to the video. So to recap the receptors it acts on. It blocks H1, it blocks 5-HT2A, it blocks 5-HT2C, it blocks 5-HT3, and then it blocks the noradrenergic alpha-2 receptor. Now let's use this information and talk about dosing. So hopefully you watched my video on sequential binding because it's relevant here for mirtazapine. Looking at the binding affinities for mirtazapine, we see that the order and potency is histamine at the top, then the serotonin receptors, then the noradrenergic receptors. So this will be an oversimplification, but it helps me to organize how this medication works. So at low doses, it's mostly just an antihistamine medication. So in doses less than 7.5 milligrams, mirtazapine is acting as an antihistamine medication. Then at low medium doses, so 7.5 to 15 milligrams, is where we start seeing the serotonergic activity. So at doses of 15 milligrams or less, mirtazapine is blocking H1, 5-HG2A, 5-HT2C, and 5-HT3. 
And then at doses above 15 milligrams is where we see the noradrenergic activity at play. So at 15 milligrams or greater is where we see it start to block the alpha-2 receptor. So let's use this information to make sense of what's occurring clinically. So in regards to dosing, the optimal dose for depression is 15 to 30 milligrams, and the max approved dose is 45 milligrams. When we take a look at the dose response curve, what we see with mirtazapine is that efficacy increases up to about 30 milligrams per day, and then it starts to go down. And looking at the dropouts, there's just a steady increase with increasing doses. So this is why the optimal dose is about 15 to 30 milligrams. Because this is the dose where you're getting the adrenergic and serotonergic activity, and the medication is still in the tolerable range. Now there's also a rumor that mirtazapine is less sedating at higher doses. Now there's no empirical evidence for this theory. The way that I think about it is that going from 0 to 7.5 milligrams of mirtazapine is going to be an incredibly sedating medication. But going from, say, 15 to 30 milligrams isn't actually that big a change in how sedating it is. So I don't think it's true that higher doses are actually less sedating, but that the increase in sedation isn't comparable to the increase in sedation at the lower dose range. So the way to make sense of this with regards to the receptors is that at 15 to 30 milligrams, you're starting to get the alpha-2 blockade, which increases noradrenergic activity, which is activating the patient. So at the higher doses, most of the histamine is already blocked at this point, so you're not getting a significant increase in the antihistaminergic effect, while you're also increasing the noradrenergic activity. So to recap, at the low doses, the 0 to 7.5 milligrams, it's mostly acting as an antihistaminergic medication. As we increase the dose, we start to see increasing serotonergic activity, and then the optimal dose for depression, which is 15 to 30 milligrams, is when we start to see the alpha-2 blockade. There are going to be some patients that are very wary of going from 15 to 30 milligrams because of the level of sedation they've experienced at that point. And it can be helpful to let them know that while it might be a little bit more sedating, it won't be of a comparable magnitude to the level of sedation they experienced at the beginning. All right, now let's move to a few of the pearls of using mirtazapine. So in a Cochrane review looking at mirtazapine versus other antidepressive agents for depression, they concluded that mirtazapine is likely to have a faster onset of action than the SSRIs. So now with mirtazapine, we can start to see antidepressant effects as early as one to two weeks. So it's a medication that works faster than the SSRIs. But it's worth knowing that it's not immediate and the maximal effects can take up to four weeks. But still, it's faster than the SSRIs. Now let's talk a little bit about the effects mirtazapine has on sleep. So mirtazapine reduces sleep latency, so it reduces the amount of time it takes to fall asleep, and it increases the total sleep duration. So overall, we see improved sleep latency, sleep duration, and sleep efficiency in depressed patients. So it's overall beneficial in sleep. It's helpful to know that at higher doses, it can disturb sleep. So in a small number of patients, it can cause restless leg syndrome, and it's more likely to cause nightmare disorder, sleepwalking, night terrors, and sleep paralysis. So it's probably in the lower dose range where it has the most beneficial impacts on sleep. Mirtazapine also has efficacy in methamphetamine use disorder. So it's thought to lower drug-seeking behavior, especially related to methamphetamines. So mirtazapine significantly reduced meth use among current users who are receiving substance use counseling. And the results appear to be independent of the effects on depression, and it also reduced sexual risky behaviors. It's also worth noting that mirtazapine might be a little bit more effective than SSRIs. And comparable to the SNRIs. In the Cipriani meta-analysis, mirtazapine was near the top medication in regards to efficacy. So to summarize, mirtazapine can be thought of as a first-line antidepressant. It's commonly used for patients with insomnia, with the downside that it can cause weight gain. It has little sexual dysfunction and very little GI side effects. Never over, work it harder, make it better, do it faster, makes us stronger more than ever, hour after hour, work is never over.